Well, good morning. I am so excited to be with you today. Thomas Wolfe said, you can't go home again. I'm glad he's wrong. It's a privilege and honor for me to come back into this sacred place and share with the congregation that invested so much in me a long, long time ago. It was the, during the singing of that song, Just As I Am, when as a teenager, sitting on about the seventh row from the front on the piano side, but then the piano side of the sanctuary, when Eddie Martin preached the gospel and gave the invitation, I gave my heart to Christ. And then I heard God's call to preach. And then you let me do it. I learned to preach at First Baptist Church, sitting now on the front row, taking notes on the pastor's sermon. And you encouraged me. So if today doesn't go very well, I guess you're to blame. <laughs> but you gave me opportunities to preach. And when it was, I think my first sermon, I was 16 years of age. It was on Youth Sunday of my junior year of high school. And I preached. And then on many Sundays, the ladies, the little old ladies, oldest ladies in the church Sunday school class would invite me to come in and teach. And they'd hand me a quarterly, but I didn't want that. I wanted to preach. And so I would stand long-haired, stand in front of those ladies, and I'd preach against the evils of tobacco and alcohol and illicit sex. And they weren't thinking about any of those things. <laughs> but they endured it, and they let me preach, and that's where I learned. Many times over the years as I've come back to Suffolk to see my brother George, and just to renew things, I would, I would come in, I'd slip into this auditorium and I'd sit somewhere, maybe on that seventh row or maybe on the front row, and I would renew my sense of call. That's taken me from age 16, I became a pastor at 19, and for 48 years, until Christmas Eve of this year, when I officially retired, I blew the candles out in the Christmas Eve service and walked out the door and started a new life, a life that's going to be different, but I hope exciting and I hope filled with ministry. But uh, it's, it's a privilege to share in this time with you. Over the years, I would sit out where you are sitting and I would look up over the head of the preacher to that picture in the baptistry. The Light of the World, Holman Hunt's famous painting. And uh, I, it occurred to me several years later when I was preaching at First Baptist Church of Alexandria, where I served for 16 years. They didn't have that picture in the, in the uh, baptistry. They had it in the balcony. And so I grew up looking at it, and then I was finishing my ministry looking at it, and it reminded me that the message of the gospel is Jesus and the difference he makes in a life. And the light of the world came into my life and changed me forever. Thank you for being here today. It's an honor to share with you. And uh, I appreciate my good friend Thurman Hayes. I, I watched him grow up. He's younger than I am, and I watched him as just a little guy. And we've maintained friendship over the years and encouraged one another. And I'm so happy that he's going to be having a sabbatical coming up this summer. You're very wise. I've had one in my life. It was several years ago, back in 2014. And when it was over, I came back to a new church. And they got a new pastor, and nobody had to move. We were already there, and we were ready for the, the years to come. So... You're, you're wise to do that, and he's going to, he's going to be a better pastor when he comes back from that experience. You know what it is to make appointments. You have doctor's appointments, and the older you get, the more of those you have. You have an appointment next week with your CPA to do your taxes. Maybe you've made appointments for uh, play dates for your children. I want to talk about keeping appointments today keeping appointments today. Several years ago, my wife Audrey and I were in Russia, back in more hopeful days, to be honest with you. And we were there on a mission trip, and we were uh, encouraging Christian missionaries and working with Muslims in Moscow. But one day we went sightseeing, 
And I was thrilled to be in that city of Moscow. As a child, it never occurred to me that one day I would freely roam those streets. Well, we were standing across the bridge that crossed the Moscow River, and in the background was the famous Cathedral of Jesus the Savior. Beautiful structure. It was built in the 1890s. The communists destroyed it, and then after communism fell, they rebuilt it, and it's a beautiful, beautiful Russian Orthodox Church. And as we were standing there looking at it, Audrey noticed an elderly grandmother with a grandson standing, and they were taking pictures like everybody else. We wandered over to her and found that she wasn't Russian. She was German, and she spoke perfect English. And we began to talk about the cathedral. And I asked her, are you a believer? And she said, oh, yes, I am. And I got excited about that. But then she said, but I don't know about Jesus. Which to me is what a believer is, you know, somebody who believes in Jesus. Well, I encouraged her to check out Jesus. And I recommended a book that maybe she could find and read and we went our separate ways. That night we met with our mission team and we talked about her and prayed for her. Two days later, in an entirely different section of Moscow, and it's a city of multiple millions of people, mid-afternoon we stopped at a little restaurant, went upstairs to a private room. Nobody was there. My team was uh, using the restroom and other things, and I, I just sat there in the empty room by myself. And up the stairs came a woman and I immediately recognized her and she recognized me and we ran to each other and embraced I said I told my friends all about you she said I told my friends all about you and we picked up the conversation right where we left it and I don't know what happened to her but I know she heard the gospel I call that a divine appointment I believe and I've come to expect them that God arranges rendezvous with people, Christians with non-Christians. He arranges your life such that you will cross paths every day or almost every day. And if you're paying attention, you'll see it. And maybe God can use you to make a difference. Our text today is Acts chapter 8. Would you turn there? Acts chapter 8, one of my favorite stories. And it's about a divine appointment. Philip is a deacon of all things, and he's preaching in Samaria and having a great revival. And uh, God's doing amazing things. He's preaching to hundreds, if not thousands of people, and multitudes are turning to the Lord. And then you come to verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candice, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. In verse 26, an angel is addressing Philip. In verse 29, it's the Holy Spirit that says, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? for his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or somebody else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water 
And the eunuch said, well, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is God's word for God's people today. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we've come with open hearts and minds and open Bibles to hear a word from you. So speak. And if you speak, Lord, your your servants will listen and we will obey. Through Christ we pray. Amen. This is the classic example in the Bible of a divine appointment. Philip is redirected to meet an Ethiopian eunuch. And on a desert road, the Gaza road, something marvelous takes place. It can happen for you. Maybe not as dramatic as this, where where an angel appears to you and, and you clearly hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, but still it can happen. And I want you to pay attention so that you will take advantage of every opportunity. On the back of your programs today, there's a listening guide. And if you, if you take notes, Uh, get that out and and it's very simple I'll give you several things that will help you number one keep your schedule open keep your schedule open now look again at Philip Philip's busy Philip was a servant of Christ and he was always busy serving the Lord and he was doing a great work God was using him and he was always listening for what was next God directs your life too, and he's got something else, something new, something refreshing every day for you if you keep your schedule open. Build some margins into your life. Philip, here's the angel, tell him to go south to the desert road, and uh, he immediately picks up and goes. He leaves a great work going on in Samaria where he's preaching to thousands to talk to one man and he doesn't know what's going to happen out there he doesn't know exactly where he's going when God tells you to do something you don't have to know all the particulars you don't have to know how it's going to all end up just obey the Lord and so he goes when prompted and meets a man and the man's life has changed can you be interrupted how do you view interruptions You've got a plan for your day, and suddenly everything changes. Do you get frustrated by that? I mean, it's human nature to be frustrated because you had a well-planned schedule for your day. Did you realize later that God was involved in that? And that God was changing plans because he had something more important for you to do. Be always willing And if you can build some free time in your day. Some of us are too busy. We schedule every minute of our waking hours. And if God wanted us to do something, a change of plans, we couldn't go because we're already committed to this or that or the other. Build some time into your schedule and be able to go. I learned a long time ago to keep an active passport all the time. Now, COVID kind of messed everybody up with that. You, you had your European vacation canceled or what have you. But we should keep an active passport. Audrey's going on a mission trip uh, in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to join her late in that trip. And I was getting real excited about it. It's going to happen in, uh, in uh, April. And uh, then I got out my passport. And, and I saw that it wasn't expired yet, but it would expire within six months. And you can't travel if it's expired or will expire in six months. I call various people, travel agents. They said, well, normally you can pay a fee and get it expedited, but uh, there's such a backlog, you can't do that either. And so I was going to have to lay aside my plans. There's one exception, Congress... People of Congress can do it, 
So I had a friend, and I called her, and uh, my passport's on the way to me now. But I learned a lesson. you got to keep an eye on that so that when God calls you, a mission trip opens up, and you're able to go. Keep your schedule open. Secondly, keep your eyes open. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he saw, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Keep your eyes open. Pay attention. Frederick Beekner says, listen to your life. See in the mundane and in the dramatic things of life, the hand of God. All moments, he says, are sacred moments. So keep your eyes open. Who is that person over there? You've never seen her before. You've never met him before. But maybe God wants you to have a conversation. Keep your eyes open. So he goes out on the road. He doesn't know what he's to look for. But then he sees an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot, probably with an entourage. He's an important fellow. You can tell that by the the carriage he's riding in. He finds out that he is the secretary of the treasury for Ethiopia. Candace is not her name. It's her title. She's the queen. He works for her. He's probably quite wealthy, certainly important and influential. But he's got some problems. He's gone to Jerusalem to worship He's gone to Jerusalem to get to know God better, but he's not Jewish. And uh, he's African. His skin is darker than other folks' skin is dark. And he is a eunuch. And the Old Testament says if you're that way, you can't go into the temple. So he went, and he could only get so close. They wouldn't let him get closer. And so he's frustrated He's going home having not accomplished his purpose. Now, he did buy a copy of the Bible while he was there. They sold him that. So now he's in his chariot reading. And the Spirit says, go and join yourself to that chariot. And so he goes to stand beside the chariot. He's an important man, this Ethiopian eunuch. He's got another problem, too, because he doesn't know God His life is empty. He's got wealth. He's got power. A lot of people bow to him, deference to him. But he is in spiritual darkness. He's in the desert, the wilderness. And that's a metaphor. Literally, he's in the desert. But it's a metaphor, too, of a life of emptiness, a life of struggle, a life of difficulty. And you meet people every day like that. They're going through something. Maybe you know it. Maybe very likely you don't know what they're going through. But he's on the desert road. During this season leading up to Easter, we spend some time remembering Jesus in his wilderness experience, that time of testing, that time of fasting and temptation. And maybe that's where you are. Or somebody you meet is a desert time. And so Philip is directed to go over to the chariot and get to know this fellow. You know people who are very happy, apparently, in their lives. You've invited them to church before. I hope you'll invite them again for Easter, but they're not interested. And maybe you've stopped asking because it sounds like a broken record. They're, they don't need God today. They're on the golf course. They're in the mountains. They're down at the beach. But tomorrow, they'll go to see their doctor, and the doctor will give them devastating news, and their world will change just like that. Never give up on somebody you care about. Never give up on anybody you meet Because you don't know what God is doing in their life and He's directed you to be with them in this moment because this is the moment that's going to be where the miracle takes place. 
Keep your schedule open. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. He walks up to the chariot and he hears this eunuch reading aloud from the Bible. The ancients, they tell me, always read out loud. They really didn't have a concept. This sounds silly, I know, but they didn't have the concept that you could read silently. Now, that's what you do all the time. And he, or when you're not listening to a book, you're reading silently. But they didn't understand that you could do that. They would read aloud. So this eunuch is reading aloud. And Philip goes up and says, do you understand what you're reading? Now, that could be, that could be a disrespectful question. That could be a condescending question. I guess we had, would have to hear him say it to make sure how it sounds. He's a very intellectual man. Do you understand? Well, of course I understand what I'm reading. But it is the Bible, and even smart people can't understand the Bible unless the Spirit of God is directing them. You see, the Bible is inspired by God. Every word on every page breathed out by God. And you can't understand it until the Spirit in you directs you. That's why a very learned university professor may not have a clue about who Jesus is and what God has done. They can read the page just like you can, but they don't have the interpretation by the Holy Spirit. So it's a good question. Do you understand what you are reading? A, a conversation starter that I use all the time when I see people reading a book, I'm so excited that children and teenagers are reading books I'll go up to them and I'll say, what are you reading? Tell me about the book you're reading. And I've never had anybody resent the question or refuse to answer it. They're kind of honored that, that I notice that they're reading. It makes them feel good. And they tell me the book they're reading and I'll ask them questions about it. And it helps if I know a little bit about the book myself. So I read book reviews all the time just to know a little bit so I can ask one question about the book they're reading. It's a good way to start conversations. I walked out of the bookstore one day and uh, a woman saw a book I was holding in my hand and she said, did you buy that in there? What, what's that about? And I stopped and I told her about it. And then another woman came up and uh, she saw us and she said, what, what is that book? And I introduced the two of them and then I went on to lunch and left them talking about that book. Now, this is an easy one. He's reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you read? How can I, he says, unless somebody explains it to me? And then Philip gets up into the chariot at the invitation of the eunuch and talks to him about the gospel. I found that everybody's got a story. Everybody I meet has a story. And if I'll take the time to open my ears and listen to them, and not, not just try to tell them something, but to honestly, sincerely listen to them, amazing things can happen. And so he's learning all about this Ethiopian eunuch and where he's coming from. Listen to people's stories and uh, not, not just a prepackaged presentation of the gospel, but listen to their story, and then you'll see how you can share Christ in the midst of their story. I got on a plane a few years ago, and I promised the Lord I'd talk to the next person that I met, and uh, be careful with that. I, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll share. And uh, the last person to get on the plane was a young woman. She must have been in her 20s. And uh, she was rather large, and she was wearing a very short skirt and very low neckline. But that's not what got my attention. She, she, was, she had tattoos from head to toe all over her body. And I said, Lord, is, that, is this the one? And she came, and it was an empty seat by me, and she came and sat beside me. And uh, I, I tried to make conversation with her, and, and I, finally I said, and you would have too, I said, I notice you've got a few tattoos. Now, it wasn't a few. It was head to toe, covered. She said, yes, 
that's the story of my life. I said, oh, well, tell me your story of your life. Now, I, I would regret that later, but she, she began <laughs> to point out every exposed inch of her body and some that shouldn't have been exposed, and she was telling me all about her life, and, and there was barbed wire around her shoulder, and she said, that's when I was in prison. And she told me she went to prison on a charge her boyfriend was selling drugs, and she got caught up in it, and she went to prison for a time. But that was her story. And then I said, well, what, what, is, what do you do for a living? And she said, I am a fifi. And, and I had never heard of that. A fifi, she said, I am a female impersonating a female impersonator. A female impersonating a female impersonator. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to. <laughs> I don't know. But she told me her story, and I'm trying to share Christ in the midst of her story. And I thought about the Apostle Paul who said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And I could talk about Jesus and the cross and the difference that he made. But everybody's got a story, so have your ears open to listen. Then number four, keep your mouth open. Keep your mouth open. Now, I said this was an easy passage. He's reading from the Old Testament, Isaiah, and you know it, uh, famous Easter passage. He's reading Isaiah 53, which is pure gospel in the Old Testament. He was led as a lamb to the shearer, and he opened not his mouth. All our sins were laid on him and so forth. Who is he talking about, himself or somebody else? And that's like a softball for Philip. And Philip began at that same scripture to preach Jesus, to tell him the good news. You've got to talk about Jesus. Live your life. Live a moral life. Lead a clean life. Lead a life of example. But that's never going to get somebody saved. You've got to share words with your, with your lifestyle. Don't be silent. Now, don't be obnoxious either. Don't be sarcastic or rude. But find a way to share Jesus' story with them so that they have a chance to be saved. Because it's, it's not your life that's going to save anybody. It's what Jesus did. And so you've trusted in him. You encourage others to trust in him. Now, he's interested. Seems to be very interested. Not everybody is. But again, you don't know. You don't know what God is doing in their life. The scripture says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, that God has set eternity in the hearts of people. So there's a, there's a, there's a Christian memory deep in the heart of everybody there's there's a sense that there's something going on I, I was talking to somebody else once on a plane it's a wonderful time to do it because you're strapped in and they can't get away from you and and you have an idea how much time you've got uh, you know when the plane's taking off and when it's supposed to land so you can you can kind of space it out and I was sharing with her Christ and she was quite openly an atheist and she was from Vienna and Austria and just not, uh, not she was interested in what I was saying to her, but she, she wasn't buying it. She, she wasn't. But I, I would tell her about Jesus and tears came in her eyes. Now, she's not going to be a believer yet, but tears are in her eyes. And she said, you know, my grandmother used to say things like that. And it sparked a memory in her. God has set eternity in the hearts of people. So open your mouth. And you don't have to preach. You don't have to know a whole lot of Bible verses. You just need to know what Jesus did for you and how he changed your life. Give them the gospel. And then the last thing. Keep your mouth open. Keep your mouth open, your ears open, your eyes open, your schedule open. Keep the door open. 
It's not said in this passage, but obviously when he preaches the good news about Jesus, that goes on for a long time. They've got a long trip, and so he's talking. And obviously he explains baptism to him. He says, now, when you give your life to Christ, you need to be baptized. So it's, it's missing in the passage, but obviously the eunuch does. He bows his head right there on the Gaza road and prays a prayer of commitment to Jesus. And then they see water, and it's the eunuch who brings it up. The eunuch says, well, there's water. You say I should be baptized. What can keep me from being baptized right now? So they stop the chariot. They get down and they go down in the water. And Philip baptizes this man. You have to come to a conclusion. So when God arranges a rendezvous, and, and look out for it now. It's going to happen this week because we've been talking about it. Keep your eyes open, your schedule open. When God sends you a different way, you can go because you've allowed enough time to it. You're observant, you're seeing what's going on, you're hearing, and you open your mouth and share. Keep the door open and invite them to give their heart to Christ. And so often, if, if, if the conversation has gone well, I will say, now does this make sense to you? And usually they'll say yes, because I try to keep it very simple. And then I will say, and th this is the question the devil doesn't want me to ask. And it's the hardest thing sometimes to, to muster up the courage to it, to do it. But I'll say, would you like to give your life to Christ right now? You can do it right now. And I smile when I say that. No pressure, but I want them to know the door is open, that they can make their commitment now. And most of the time, they don't. But some of the time, they do. And their life is changed, and my life is blessed. Philip baptizes him. They come up out of the water, and then God takes them each in a different direction. Philip goes on to another assignment. The Ethiopian unit goes back to Ethiopia. He goes back to Africa and starts the Coptic church in Africa. If you know any Ethiopians, I found them to be the most wonderful people in the world, the most beautiful people, the most kind people. They've got a rich Christian tradition in Ethiopia, and it comes from this moment that never would have happened had Philip been too busy, had he not had his eyes opened, his ears open, if he hadn't talked and invited the man in. Who's God going to direct you to? Now, you got your doctor's appointment. Keep it and get your taxes done. Honor your commitments, but look for the divine appointments that God is surely going to bring your way. Would you pray with me, please? We're going to sing a song and the service will be over, but the pastors are going to be at the front of the room after the service is dismissed, and if you would like to talk to one of them, they would be eager to talk to you, and I would too. If today you'd like to do what the eunuch did and give your heart to Christ, I would be happy, and they would be happy to introduce you to Christ or to join this church or to make another commitment of your life. Lord, thank you for your word today, and I pray you would Open our hearts and eyes and ears and mouths to share with somebody who needs you. And Lord, they're all around us. Even today, they don't think about it at all, but sometime this week, they will be thinking about it. So direct our paths. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.